the topic for the day uh, is uh, with respect to current affairs uh, related to the uh, you know of economics and current development i understand that this is uh, this is very very important when uh, in our country we read about uh, pm cares fund uh, which is all devoted to money and when we read about uh, in indian context with respect to rbi giving help to the government or uh, when we hear about that a particular country saudi arabia asking a particular money back from pakistan or take an or take an example about uh, uh, the rbi coming in news with respect to its poli- with respect to its policy decision and its impact on all of us and then we hearing this term such as inflation then we are hearing this particular term repo rate reverse repo rate all and all and uh, there's much more and to know what is this much more over to you sir yeah hi um so for today's lecture what i want to do is that i have been so i have been reading economics myself a lot right? and and there are a lot of pieces of news articles etc that i think have become really important now like all lectures because we take once a week lecture right? it's impossible for me to do a daily current affairs sort of session with you so what i want to do today just like every other lecture is probably focus on some important let's say topics and some important developments that have happened in the world of economics and what i will also like to do on the side is i'll try to explain to you some basic phenomena pertaining to economics as and when they are related to the particular topic right so i understand economics can become technical sometimes right because some of more a lot a lot of you might have taken economics in class 12 like i myself when i wrote clad i didn't have economics but that time these questions also didn't come in clad but for so this session is going to be very easy for someone who has a background in economics who's done economics in 11th and 12th and for people who haven't done economics there might be certain terms here that you might not be able to understand so i have kept open my zoom link okay so if there is anything that you want to ask if there is any comment that you want to make if there is there is if there is any doubt right because there will obviously be some technical terms you can ask here but don't worry about that as well i think harsh and i just spoke today we will also take a session tomorrow i think same time and we'll talk about certain basic concepts and phenomena in econ- in economics right because that will then help you to understand what we discussed today and it will also help you vis-a-vis when you are understanding the articles etc when you read newspapers etc pertaining to economics right so let me just try to share the screen and then let's look at the current affairs in economics <coughs> one second Yeah, is this screen share visible to everyone? Harsh, is it visible to you? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. One second. Okay, so so let's one sec. Okay, so Ashish and Arushi, you can ask your questions here. I'll keep open the group chat because there are bound to be certain questions that and certain concepts which might not might which might not be clear to everyone. Okay, so let's just start broadly with the things that have happened in the last one year. I have basically covered everything that can come in the form of a paragraph, right? So obviously there could be questions which come in the form of let's say who is the chairman of this committee. Or let's say um, there's a question which says the 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 president of the so the chief of this body is whom right so obviously i can't tell you all those things those static current affairs you can obviously gather when you read the newspapers but i've tried to cover each and everything that might come in the form of paragraphs which deal with a couple of concepts at least per topic okay so having said that let's just begin so the first thing that i want to discuss is the imminent slowdown in the indian economy right so unless and until you've been living under a rock you know that the indian economy has been gearing towards the slowdown right things are not as good as we would want them to be obviously there are certain issues as to why the indian indian economy is suffering the primary reason is that we have obviously in the past uh, let's say 4 5 years taken some economic decision which have not fared well for the country at large and obviously then all of that was exacerbated by the corona virus pandemic that we are facing right now okay so some that statistics has been statistics have been released the first is that the gdp growth rate 
for the third quarter okay is 4.7% which is the lowest gdp growth rate we've seen in the last 7 years okay now this is released by this org body called nso national statistics organization now recently nso was a body that was formed after merging two other bodies that were associated with the work of conducting its surveys and coming up with statistics in our country this is the cso central statistics organization and nso okay so all of them were merged and they formed a body the new body called the nso which falls under the ministry of statistics and pumped uh, under the under the mosp right uh, one second so mosp stands for ministry of statistics and program implementation okay you can jot that down or you can obviously read about it later so until now the world had been looking at india as the fastest growing economy but that has changed right we have also seen how china has now sort of let's say recovered from the effects of the corona virus pandemic so if you've been following the news yesterday i think there was a large dj slash pool party in wuhan so these guys are now throwing pool parties and the entire world is basically suffering from corona corona and india has not even hit the peak of the corona virus yet right so india was supposed to be uh i'll ashish okay i'll just check the establishing date ashish i will try to include it or you can probably google it my idea here is to give you the concepts right and if you understand these things at last then you can obviously jot down these statistical points because i'm assuming you're reading the newspapers anyways okay anyways continue um so obviously now china has registered a 6.5% growth rate in the similar in the same quarter therefore we have lagged behind china okay now the, there are certain other factors which were pointed out by this gdp growth rate report that came out by the nso the first is that fixed investment rate has been declining sharply since 2011 12 and then it had plateaued around 2016 which meant that which meant that there was a deceleration in growth since 2017 and 18 okay so the issue with fixed investment rate is those of you who have studied economics would know that investment as a concept in economics is studied a little bit differently from the general concept of investment that we see in in way that we understand in regular parlance right so investment in economics means that you are creating assets you are creating capital right so obviously fixed investments have been declining therefore that means that the companies and people are expecting a slowdown and they are not investing in assets to let's say boost production once that happens then obviously gdp will not increase much faster okay now the second point that was relatively relevantly pointed out was that there has been a decline in the savings in the economy right so in 2011 the percentage of savings was 32.7% but now in the last in the last year which is 2018 it has declined to 29.3% okay now the reason why the savings has declined is because there is a declining wage growth so let's say inflation is on the rise gdp and let's say all the factors being consistent if the wages do not grow at the rate that inflation or other factors are growing therefore obviously let's say i earn 100 rupees today okay and everything that i need in the market comes for 90 bucks so i can then save 10 rupees right but let's say so let's say inflation increases by 10% and my wages only grow by 5% so now everything that i need to purchase from the market comes the next year for 95 rupees okay however my salary has sorry comes for is, is raising at 10% right so it comes at for 99 rupees and my salary or my wages have only increased by 5% so the salary that i get now is 105 rupees so therefore last time when i was saving 10 bucks this time i am not able to save those 10 bucks and i am only saving those 5 6 rupees right and that is the problem that our econo economy is seeing that the real wage rate wage growth rate has been declining okay now there's a council known as the prime minister's economic advisory council okay one of the members in that advisory council had said that india is looking at something known as a middle income trap okay so middle income trap is basically a phenomena that was pointed out by the world bank in its 2007 report so let me try to explain to you what the middle income trap is okay so according so the concept of the middle income trap is let's say there is an economy like india where initially the wages were low okay so because the wages were low companies could pay the employees less money which would mean that the cost of production of any one particular good let's say a pen would be lower 
and then because the cost of production is lower then we could export it to other developed countries and because our goods would be cheaper there therefore the demand for our goods would increase and we would benefit out of it right but over the years because the economy has also seen a little progress the wages in india have also increased okay or any so let's say if the wages now increase it means that the same product will cost a little more because now the factory owner will have to pay a little more wage or a little more salary to the producer right now as this happens our goods in the international market start losing their competitiveness right so if the goods become expensive then obviously people will buy less of them and there they could shift to other cheaper products right so now the middle income trap is when this has happened wages have increased however however the economy has not been able to progress right so let's say india continue this till this day continues to do very basic manufacturing right we don't indulge in high end manufacturing let's say if you look at the example of germany germany basically also is a very strong manufacturing economy but it manufactures very high value products right so it manufactures machines let's say which are then used to manufacture shoes in india right so obviously the machine is a high end product and obviously more money and more expertise is required therein and a greater value is generated right and the machine is then used by workers in india or bangladesh to make shoes now obviously lesser of a less of an input is required in making shoes and therefore the value added is lower so in a, in a, in the context of the indian economy what the prime minister's economic advisory council is saying that we can because of this particular reason for fall in the middle income trap because a our wages will increase so our cheap goods will become expensive however at the same time we have not invested enough in high end products therefore we will not be able to compete in the high end products in the already developed countries so we'll be left in the middle we will a either not be very poor but we will also not be able to become very rich so currently a country in the world that is facing the middle income trap an example is brazil okay so it's predicted that india might also be going down that path unless and until proper economic measures are taken by the government okay now the second topic that i would like to discuss with you is the one second yeah so second topic is the 15th finance commission okay one second so exporting does not help the country to increase economy so exporting obviously does help the country to increase the economy but the issue is that as i told you right let's say i export something for 10 rupees now the reason why it is being able to less the reason why the factory is able to export it for 10 rupees is because it is giving me 1 rupee so as and when economy grows obviously then my expectation for salary also increases and let's say my salary now let's say becomes 2 rupees so now the company will have to sell the same good at 11 rupees now the moment the company starts selling that particular product for 11 rupees somebody sitting outside in the world will say no i don't want to buy something for 11 rupees because let's say a bangladesh or a south africa is selling the same thing to me for 10 and a half rupees so that's how the country is fall into this middle income trap right because your wages are increasing and i'm only manufacturing shoes i am not able to manufacture let's say computers or any high end product as such where i could have that sort of a value addition so this is that i'm talking about ashish i hope that's a little clear to you now okay okay so let's talk about the 15th finance commission so under article 280 of the constitution it is stated that the president forms the finance commission every 5 years okay now what the job of the finance commission is very simple okay so in india states collect their own taxes and the states also collect a lot of taxes that are that described as central taxes taxes which accrue to the center right now obviously the center does not need all of the central taxes that accrues to the center therefore every 5 years the financial commission finance commission is set up at the behest of the president and the job of the finance commission is to basically lay down a plan as to how the central taxes would be equitably distributed to the states okay so the 15th finance commission has now been proposed okay so under the 14th finance commission for so the center used to keep 50 Eight uh, percent of the taxes that it collected, and the remaining forty-two percent used to be given down to the states. Now, under the fifteenth finance commission, the state is going to keep fifty-nine percent of the tax, and the states will only get one percent of the tax. This is because one percent of the tax will now be used to, will now be sent to the union territories of Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh. Right? Earlier, they used to be classified as states, so obviously the state taxes. So the devolution would be given to them directly however now since because since because they have become union territories after removal of article 370 they come under the direct ambit of the center okay so let's look at 
the formula that the 15th finance commission has used and how this is different from the 14th finance commission okay so the first principle or the criteria that they use for devolution devolution basically means redistributing a tax to the state is the first concept is of income distance okay so in the 14th fc the income distance was 50 and in the 15th fc the income distance was 45 so income distance basically means let so let's say there is one state which raises which has the maximum amount of let's say taxes that the state pays so you will take that state's income as one right and let's say then there is a state which pays let's say 70% of taxes of that state then you will give a value of 0.7 to that particular state and based on that based on the distance from the state that makes the maximum money you will redistribute income right so let's say there is a state that makes 100 rupees in taxes okay and there is another state that makes only 10 rupees in taxes now obviously it is the center's responsibility to make sure that the state which is making 10 rupees in taxes should be helped a little more so that is the concept of income distance okay now then as per the 14 finance commission 17.5% or 17.5% value was given to the population of 1971 however the 15 finance commission completely ignores the uh, the 1971 population in in the 14th fc uh 2011 population was given 10% weightage and the 15th finance commission gives a 15% weightage to this population now this issue vis-a-vis 14th and 15th finance commission when there is not enough importance given to the population 1971 and more importance is given to population in 2011 has caused some states to register a protest right for example there are certain states like tamil nadu etc which have done a great job in making sure that india does not go through a population explosion so these states have put in a lot of effort they have educated their people they have distributed contraceptives they have done e- everything that is possible in their path to make sure that the fertility rate de- uh, comes down and the number of people in the though the rate of increase of number of people in the state comes down right so obviously these states have put in some efforts now these states are saying that if you then look at a state like uttar pradesh or bihar which has obviously not done as well as a state like tamil nadu so obviously it's base, it's sort of a punishment to the states that have done well to control population right otherwise if they had not done well to control population then their share of taxes that they receive would continue to increase so this is an area that is becoming problematic for these states okay and this is the issue that some states are raising that why have you given more emphasis to the population in 2011 and why not to the population is 19, in 1971 okay now the fourth parameter that they have used is about is area so it remains the same obviously the larger the area of your state the more money you obviously need right so 15% of weightage is given in both then in the 14 finance commission the forest cover was given a 7.5% weightage however in the 15 finance commission there is no weightage given to forest cover instead they have created a new category called forest and ecology right so based on the policies that the states are following for their forest and based on their ecological policies they are getting a 10% weightage in in terms of devolution of taxes okay then there is another important concept known as demographic performance right so in the 14th finance commission demographic performance was absent they have introduced it in the 15th finance commission so demographic performance basically means total fertility rate right so the total fertility rate is basically the number of children an adult woman will have in her lifetime okay so india so some states in india so obviously let's say you would have heard this principle right hum do hamare do so if every lady is producing only two children in her lifetime then obviously the population will not increase however there is of 10% so they give a weightage of 0.1 to people who well, let me say let's say to children who don't survive or children who get or people who die die early than their let's say late 60s or 70s right so the total the let's say the replacement ratio that india wants is 2.1 so if, if every adult female produces 2.1 kids in her life and then india will have a stable population so there are some states which have a total fertility rate of 1.8 1.9 which means that the states have done a good job to fight population explosion but on the other hand there still continue to be some states which have a fertility rate of 4 5 and 6 right which means that these states are going for a population explosion so if some states have put in enough efforts if they have reduced their total fertility rates then 12.5% weightage is given to them 
Similarly, a new concept known as tax effort has been introduced. Tax effort basically means the ratio of total taxes actually collected to the taxes that could have been collected. It's a ratio of total taxes to the estimate of taxes, right? So obviously, it this policy is there to reward states to make sure that their tax collection mechanism is better, right? Because obviously, the entire point of this exercise is to give back the taxes to the center. So if a state is producing and giving the giving more tax to the center in terms of let's say better administrative policies etc which are leading to a higher collection of tax then that state obviously deserves to be rewarded okay so this is the primary idea behind the so this is the differentiating factor between the 14th and the 515 finance commission it has been in the news a lot because a lot of south indian states have been expressing a grouse and they're saying that a lot of north indian states like jharkhand bihar and uttar pradesh are holding us down and we are being punished for performing exceedingly well on the social parameters that were given to us by the government in the late 70s and early 80s okay now under the 15th finance commission there is more devolution to local bodies as compared to the 14th finance commission okay so under the 14th finance commission they just used to give money to the states and then they said it's up to you you form their state finance commission and then you decide how money is to be given to the local bodies but the 15th finance commission gives certain specific guidelines as to how money is to be distributed by the to the local bodies right because obviously the state finance commission wasn't doing a good enough job of giving money to the municipal corporations and the panchayats okay so the next topic that i want to discuss is gst now i'm not going to discuss gst in detail in the sense what exactly gst is gst has been around since 2017 it's been 3 years now i'm assuming that you guys know a little about gst if you don't you can ask me in the doubt session or you can message harsh probably in tomorrow's class or some other class i'll go when i talk about basic concepts in economics maybe i'll try to explain what gst is to you but right now i'm going to focus on what has been in the news vis-a-vis -vis gst okay so there have been two things the first thing is if you've been following the news you realize that there is a certain tension between states and the center so the states have been saying that uh, they've been asking the center to give them money that is due to them under the gst because they need the money to fight the pandemic but the center is saying that because of the pandemic and because of let's say maybe certain policies of the center there has been a lower gst collection as opposed to what they had expected now obviously if there is a lower gst collection there would be losses that accrue to the state right so the state uh, so the center has now said that there was a cess which was known as the compensation cess that the idea of the compensation cess was that the extra tax was levied on luxury and sin goods like alcohol and cigarettes etc to make sure that if there are any losses to the states because of the gst this compensate this compensation cess would be used to make sure that the states get their own uh, due right so the reason why there could be losses to the states is because before gst there used to be uh source based taxes is taxes right like yeah, like your excise duty vat etc but gst is a destination based tax so gst is levied when the final sale occurs at a late at, at, a, at a destination which is different from the which could and which most likely is different from the destination where the good was produced and therefore some states believe that they, we could obviously suffer a let's say shortfall in revenue so the center said that for 5 years that is till 2022 we will protect you against all of these losses and basically Basically, the money that will be required to fulfill this shortcoming, so to, to fulfill this shortfall, would be the money that would come from this compensation cess that I'm talking about. One second. Okay. Now, another thing that has happened vis-a-vis -vis GST is that the government has talked about this Sabka Vishwas. scheme okay so as i told you gst is something which subsumes your service tax and central excise taxes so now the central government is saying that there is no point in me and in the government fighting these service tax and central excise tax cases which are pending in multiple tribunals etc so the center is saying that there are so i am going to come up with a sabka vishwas scheme which means that i am willing to let's say do away with all these disputes so either you give me the money that is due to me okay one second okay or they're saying that if there are proceedings pending against you against the service tax and central excise tax access if there is an investigation we also don't want to waste money so what you do is you tell us how much money you owe to us we will 
not charge you with any criminal case and this is the angle of amnesty that is being provided here so the state is saying a bahut ho gaya send service tax central excise tax ye sab khatam karo we don't need it so we want to do away with the tribunal also so therefore the center is coming up with a sabka vishwas scheme wherein they are saying please disclose whatever tax you have to pay to us if you tell us whatever tax you have to pay if you if you tell us how much tax you have hidden from us it's okay we will not initiate any criminal complaints against you okay um then uh, if you've been following the news rbi has also been in the news and the single most important thing that happened is that rbi transferred 1.76 lakh crore rupees to the union government okay now there is a section in the rbi act known as section 47 which talks about allocation of surplus profits of the rbi right so 1.76 lakh crore rupees that was given by the RBI to the central government created a lot of political storm. People were saying that the government is pressurizing. As the Sabka Vishwas, yeah, Sabka Vishwas scheme has been launched. It's a legacy scheme. It's an ongoing scheme. It's basically saying that any disputes that are already also it's a retrospective scheme. It's not for schemes. It's not for disputes that will occur from today, right? It's a retrospective scheme because now the disputes won't go to a service tax tribunal because service tax and your other tax other central other vat etc have been removed right so these taxes don't exist anymore so it's only of retrospective application okay now coming back to rbi okay so so a lot of people have been saying and there's a political storm that the government has pressurized the rbi to give this much money to them however what you have to understand is that before this what rbi used to do is that they used to put in a lot of the profit and the surplus that they make in their contingency fund and for developing assets of their own right however it's not that this government has been pressurizing rbi in 2013 there was a committee known as the malegaon committee which recommended that the rbi really does not need to keep so much money with itself for contingency purposes right so there was a committee in 2013 then similarly there was another committee recently known as the bimal jalan committee i think it's 2016 but this is the most recent committee you should check up upon it so the bimal jalan committee itself told rbi that listen you guys really don't need to keep so much money you can give this money to the central government because the central government can then use this much money better it can put it for education it can put it for healthcare it can use it for defense or any other purpose right so the recommendation came directly from the bimal jalan committee so this bimal jalan committee becomes important and once the bimal jalan committee and the malegaon committee both said that listen rbi you really don't need this much money with yourself therefore the uh, amount of money that the rbi has been giving the states uh, has been giving the central government has increased i think day before yesterday i forgot to mention here rbi again has given some 55 60000 crores to the central government under the section 47 of the rbi act itself okay so basically what i why i want to discuss is is that you have to know the names of two these two important committees malegaon committee and the bimal jalan committee okay now another thing that i think is very important is digital payments right because digital payments is something that a lot of you might have already used by now you have i think given 100 bucks to harsh for this course right so most of you would have used some form of digital payment so digital payments are being a reality and the government of india and our prime minister also keeps on talking about digital india right so digital payments is something that i want to discuss so recently what the rbi has done is to 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 make sure that there is a flow of money in the economy to so make sure that the things keep on running it has removed any charges that used to occur via neft and rtgs okay so earlier on there were some minor charges that used to occur if you make payments via neft and rtgs so the rbi has said that we are not charging any we are not uh, so we are removing the charges for these payments and these benefits should be directly transferred to the consumers now another very interesting thing that the rbi has done is that it has waived off the merchant discount rate for must merchant discount rate charges for rupee and upi transactions okay so basically if let's say some if some of you are shop owners you must understand let's say i come to your shop and i give you 5 10000 rupees in cash okay if i buy a product worth 10000 rupees in cash i give you 10000 rupees in cash you are happy i am happy however let's say i have a credit card or a debit card and i say oh i don't have cash i will 
I want to make a digital payment. Now the issue is that after let's say the limit of ten thousand rupees or eight thousand rupees, whatever the limit was, one or two percent extra money would be charged, and this was known as the merchant discount rate. So generally, the merchant would suffer out of it. Sometimes the merchants would transfer this month uh, uh, rate to the consumers, and the consumers would have to pay a little more money, right? So RBI has now said that we I am do we are doing away with the merchant discount rate. If you make transactions via rupee cards or UPI payments, now obviously rupee and UPI are both Indian, and therefore RBI is going for it. These exemptions are not valid for your Visa cards or your uh, what is that other thing, Mastercard payments. It apply only for UPI, rupee and UPI. Okay. Now another thing that has happened recently is that if you are a company which has an annual turnover of fifty crore rupees, then you have to accept rupee and UPI as modes of payment. Okay. You can't say no to someone who comes with a rupee ta- a rupee a debit card or someone who says that I will use UPI to transfer money. If your annual turnover is above fifty crore rupees, you obviously have to accept these form of payments. Okay, so rupee and UPI are the products of the National Payment Corporation of India. Okay. and national payment corporation of india is basically an organization that operates retail payments and settlements that's its mandate it is formed under the initiative of obviously the reserve bank of india and the indian bankers association okay and it traces its origin to the payment and settlement systems act of 2007 okay now a little data about digital payments because you sh- you have to understand how di- how much digital payments are increasing every year and therefore why digital payments are so important okay so there is a concept known as compounded annual growth rate which means that year on year how many percentage terms in how in, in in percentage terms how many times something is seeing a growth okay so in terms of digital in terms of cagr digital payments have seen a 61% terms in volume And 19% growth rate in terms of value, respectively, over the last five years. So every year it's going, growing by 60% in volume and roughly 20% in value. Okay. Now again, there are certain committees that become important. So these are two committees that I want to mention, which 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 are important vis-a-vis digital digital payment infrastructure in India. Now these commit commit. See, these committees are the Ratan Vatal Committee of 2016 and the Nandan Nilekani Committee of 2019. Okay, these two committees are important. Another thing that I found in the news recently, which becomes important, is that there is an artificial AI-based chatbot known as Pi. Okay, now Pi is to create awareness about NPCI's products. We have Fastag, Rupee, etc. Right. So this has been developed by this Bangalore-based startup called Corover Private Limited. That's not important. What is important is that there is an artificial intelligence-enabled chatbot known as Pi, and the job of Pi is to basically create awareness about fastag rupee upi etc all of these are basically npci products okay um now i want to talk to you about one second yeah so i want to talk to you about this concept of masala bonds okay so if so i th- i think some of you fastag is for karya ash is that thing only that fastag thing so pi basically is a chatbot that will spread awareness to people they will tell people to use fastag why fastag is better they will tell people to use upi and they will tell people to go for rupee debit cards that's the job of the artificial intelligence based software so yeah fastag is that only um okay so let's talk about masala bonds okay so see bond you get so do you guys understand what bonds are So if so basically let's say I need some money, okay, I will issue a bond to you. I will say that okay, I am giving you this piece of paper. I need hundred rupees. On this bond, I will keep on paying you ten rupees every year, and at the fifth year, I will give you the hundred rupees back along with the ten rupees that you have accumulated every year. Okay, so this is how a bond works. Okay, so in the financial market, when certain companies or certain corporations or even the government sometimes when they want to raise money, they issue bonds. Okay, so it is called a bond because you are legally so I don't know if it's true, but you are legally bound to pay back that money. Or, or to pay back the value that is mentioned on that bond, right? So, generally, bonds that are issued in India are obviously denominated in rupees. Let's say I want hundred rupees. So when I write down a contract, I say that okay, I have a bond worth hundred rupees. I will pay you five rupees at interest on this bond, known as coupon payment. 
Now, if a bond is issued in the United States of America and people in the United States of America want to buy that bond, then obviously that bond is issued in dollars. Okay. Now, what masala bonds are? Masala bonds are basically Indian bonds that are issued by Indian companies. How and then the money comes into Indian companies, but the bonds are issued in dollars. Okay. So why this is a little different? Because obviously the customer in the United States of America, let's say that person wants to invest in an Indian company, he doesn't understand rupees, etc., and he doesn't want to be bothered with the exchange rate fluctuation between rupees and dollars, because to him, what he's earning in terms of dollars is the most important factor, right? Because that person is going to spend money in dollars. Similarly, for an Indian. what i am earning in rupees is the most important to me right because i am going to generally spend that money in terms of rupees itself so so because of this major reason international transactions into india had been stopped and people were not interested in buying rupee denominated bonds now to target these rich foreign individuals and companies india has come up with this concept of masala bonds so these are raised by companies in india but they are denominated in dollars now the only issue is let's say i today say that i need 70 rupees from the market okay so i issue a bond worth 1 dollar and i say that i will make a repayment worth 5 like say i'll make i'll repay this 5 1 dollar to you in 3 1 dollar to you in 3 years time now let's say in 3 years time the rupee the value of 1 dollar is so let's say today it's 70 bucks in let's say 3 years the value of the rupee to a dollar is let's say 100 rupees so what effectively happens is that i have to pay 100 rupees back to that person had i issued a rupee denominated bond i would have only had to pay 70 bucks and whatever little interest on the side right so this is why masala bonds are a little problematic also however asian development bank has listed a 10 year masala bond okay worth about some 850 crore rupees on the global securities market of india exchange which is known as india inx okay now these bonds are listed in the luxembourg exchange so just like we have an exchange in india like the bombay stock exchange nsc and then we also have the india inx similarly there is another exchange in luxembourg so these bonds have been issued in on two exchanges they have been listed on two exchanges in the luxembourg exchange and in the indian exchange okay so this is the first time a foreign issuer and a supranational is doing primary listing with india and right so these bonds are issued by adb asian development and that's not an indian company so this is the first time that a foreign issuer is doing a primary listing with india okay so basically the money that is going to be raised out of these masala bond is going to be invested in the gift ifsc so gift if you know is this so gift city is the international financial center that is being propped up in gujarat okay you can lead a read a little about it it's not current now it's been there for a couple, for, for a few years now therefore i have not mentioned it here in detail if you want to know or read a little bit more about it you can type gift city gujarat okay now another thing which has been in the news recently is e-commerce okay now why india's e-commerce market is the most attractive market in the world is because we are growing at an annual rate of 51% which is by far the highest rate of growth that the e-commerce market is seeing in any country right so that is the reason why walmart is coming into india why amazon is also coming into india every international company wants a pie out of this indian gift of this growing indian market right and so in the market in the sorry in the e-commerce space there are two models of working right so first is the market based model where let's say the company that is taking money from you only runs a marketplace it's like a platform right let's say uber is a marketplace for cabs let's say if uber didn't have its own cabs i as a normal person could say that i want to put my car on uber and you can hire that particular car right so that is the marketplace model then the second model is the in must so mind the marketplace model the platform has no share in operating the business it's only connecting those people and it can take commissions out of it okay now the second model is the inventory based model so this is basically what your companies like flipkart and amazon also keep kept on doing let's say let's say amazon sells products from everyone however a good 30 40 50% of the products that are available on amazon would be the products that are being produced by amazon these are the products that are being sourced by amazon and amazon is earning a lot of money because amazon is pushing its own products into your 
portfolio and you keep on buying them right so in these two models 100% fdi is allowed in the marketplace model obviously because let's say if there's a marketplace model in india then a lot of indian people can list their enterprises and list their products on the marketplace therefore it's it's beneficial for the average indian consumer and at the average indian producer so 100% fdi is allowed in the automatic route under the marketplace model however fdi is not permitted in the inventory based model right because let's say some tomorrow some company comes into india and it goes it makes a beautiful e-commerce platform and then it only continues to sell its own products so the average indian producer average indian consumer would lose out and therefore fdi is not allowed okay now in february 2019 some important rules for e-commerce came into effect let me talk to you about the three major rules okay now the first rule is that obviously if an e-commerce firm has a stake in some company it owns a percentage of the company then they are not allowed to sell products from that particular company exclusively okay now the second thing is no more exclusive deals for selling products on their platform right so just say for example sometimes there are news that one plus eight only available on amazon.com or this iphone 11 only available on flipkart so the government has said now you can't have any more exclusive deals because what it does is that it if it's take though it's bad for competition obviously because if there is only one seller then that seller can set what set whatever price they want therefore consumers lo lose out and secondly it forces a lot of producers to then go on with specific deals with these platforms and they can say that since we are the only seller the platforms can exploit both both the producers and the consumers themselves right so the government has said no more exclusive deals now secondly the government has said that if you're running an e-commerce platform then no more than 25 percent of the inventory can be from a single vendor right so let's say i run open a platform today and i just sell my own products and maybe 10 percent of the products from other people in the market then obviously it is going to be a monopolistic platform and i'll not be giving the best terms of interest to those people right so therefore the government has said that i can only sell 25 percent of my own inventory or or anyone's inventory right so let's say there's a person x he can only form 25 percent of the products that i'm selling i for the less 75 percent of the other products i have to go to other people okay then another thing that the government has said that there will be no more deep discounts because it distorts the level playing field against brick and mortar shops right so brick and mortar shops are your regular shops they have to pay electricity bills they have to hire staff etc so there are certain expenses that these shops have to incur however if you're an online platform then you only have to hire a warehouse and as and when whenever you need to sell those products somebody from the warehouse can make sure deliver those products right? so obviously the cost for product of delivery and the cost of holding those goods is much cheaper for you so because it's it's it's, it's a populistic measure because obviously people who own brick and mortar shops they were not comfortable with the idea that amazon was giving 70 percent discount 80 percent discount because quite frankly these people could not afford those sort of discounts right so this change has been brought in with regards to the e-commerce policy um, then another thing that's been in the news very recently is this idea of elephant bond, right? So I'm assuming you know, know you understand a little about what bonds are, okay? So there was a high level advisory group headed by this economist called Surjit Bhallaji, okay? So this name is very important because you, so these two names are important, elephant bonds and Surjit Bhallaji. So he suggested that the government should issue elephant bonds, okay? So the idea of an elephant bond is very simple. What they're saying is that it is not a mystery that people in India have hidden black money abroad. And whatever said and done after demonetization, not a lot of that black money actually came to India, right? So the government is now looking at other strategies. So one of the strategies is that Surjit Bhalai said that you give this angle of amnesty to people who have hidden their black money, right? So if people today come and say that I am, I'm sorry, I have 100 crores hidden abroad under the elephant bonds. I will be given complete immunity if I invest 50 crore of that money into a 25 year old, 25 year sovereign bond, right? So the lock in period for my 25, 50 crore investment would then be 25 years. So for 25 years, my 50 crores would be locked in a bond. Now, obviously, I will get some interest payment out, there, out of that bond. It's not a waste investment. And 25 years later, I will get my money back and I'll also get the interest that I'm earning in 20, over 25 years. And the rest of the 50 crore rupees, I can keep and do whatever I want to do. So sovereign bond means that a bond that is issued by the central government. So let's say I'm a company, right? So let's say I'm Amazon or I'm, let's say I'm, I'm Haldiram 
and i issue a bond in the market and i say that okay and on a 100 rupee bond i will give you 10 rupees every year so that's a bond that i am putting out myself right but i am a company i am haldiram i can go bankrupt tomorrow and then i might not be able to pay you back the money so sovereign bond basically means that the government of india is saying that boss i need 100 rupees here take a bond now i will not give you 10 bucks i will give you 5 rupees now why would people subscribe to a sovereign bond because haldiram can default at any point of time government of india is never going to default right because imagine the situation if government of india is defaulting on a bond payment if government of india doesn't have money then honestly like your return from a bond that you had purchased from government of india is the last thing that you have to worry about okay for financial markets the country itself would collapse so the bond that is issued by the government of the country is known as a sovereign bond i hope that's clear to you ashish okay so similarly elephant bond is a 25 year sovereign bond so now why the government has come up with sovereign bond is because it does two things first black money comes to india the second is that if you look at india there are certain sectors like the infrastructure sector where investments take a long time so the, the this idea is known as gestation period right so let's say i have to put in money to build a shopping mall Like a shopping mall can be built in two years, and then I can give a loan to that shopping to that company who's making a shopping mall. They can start a shopping mall in two years, and they'll start earning money out of it, and they'll start repaying that money to me, right? However, let's say I want to construct a thousand kilometer long highway, or I want to construct five new railway lines. Now, obviously, a thousand kilometer highway will not be constructed in two years. It will take ten, fifteen years, right? So. therefore we need certain investment in projects like this so that long investment like 15 20 year investment where in repayment periods for these bonds or for these loans will start later so they'll start 10 years down the line 12 years down the line so that's one of the primary reasons that the infrastructure sector in india is facing a lot of npa problem right so let's say i took a money from let's i took money from icic bank and i said that i will start repayment in 5 years but my project initially i thought will start in 5 years but i probably didn't get permissions or maybe there were protests maybe there were riots or something and then my project is going to get delayed by 5 years now icici bank is not going to wait right it'll stay i want my money back i want my interest back and where will i pay the interest from the road that i wanted to create has not been created so i am not earning any money out of it right therefore i will say i'm sorry i am bankrupt your money is gone so the government wants to handle this problem because banks can only give short term loans right because the thing is banks can give you loans but the banks also have to make payments to deposit holders let's say i have put in 100 rupees in icici bank tomorrow i'll say okay give me 105 rupees because 5% and annual interest you're giving so the banks also have to make sure that they have enough money in hand to keep paying their depositors so therefore there's a mismatch between the assets that the bank has in terms of let's say 15 20 year investment in roads and the liabilities that they have when abhinav singh he can randomly come at any point of time and say please give me all my money back so that's the problem with banking finance however if there's a person who has locked in the money for 25 years that money is not going anywhere and that money can then very easily be used to invest in let's say infrastructure products like building dams building maybe a nuclear power reactor these things which take time so the money from these sovereign bond etc which has a 25 year year lock in period can be used for that okay uh then once do we have time okay let's discuss one last topic so this topic that i want to discuss is the multi dimensional poverty index right so i hope i don't have to explain to you what poverty is poverty kabhi bhi hota hai however what generally happens is that in india you have a very objective and a very let's say on paper statistical sort of a way to measure po- poverty right you say that if you earn less than 25 30 rupees a day then you are poor right but somebody who is earning 22 rupees is also poor somebody who is earning 2 rupees is also classified as poor now obviously there is a world of difference between somebody who is earning 20 rupees and somebody who is earning 22 rupees and on the other hand somebody who is earning 27 rupees is not going to be considered poor right so he will be outside the ambit of the poverty reduction schemes of the government so to counter this flawed methodology in 2010 there were these two organizations the first one is obviously the united nations development program and the second is the oxford poverty and human development initiative they came up with this methodology and they developed this index known as the multi dimensional poverty index so this multi dimensional poverty index measures two thing a to it measures how many poor people are there 
which let's say everything which a lot of other statistics measure but b and most importantly it also measures the in, in, in intensity of the property that okay there are 100 poor people in india but it also measures how actually how poor these 100 people are okay so accord so there are 10 indicators under this index so these indicators are nutrition child mortality matlab kitne bacche mar rahe hain within the first 5 years years of schooling how many years of schooling someone had availability of cooking fuel to someone sanitation drinking water availability of electricity housing and assets the sort of money these people have the sort of gold or houses land etc that these people have so these are the 10 indicators that are tracked here and if someone is deprived of at least three indicators then that person is classified as poor okay so they are known as mpi or multi dimensional poverty index poor if they lack in if they are if they are deprived in three of these indicators and the intensity is measured by by what percentage are they deprived in these indicators right so therefore both incidence of poverty and intensity of poverty is measured okay so the 2009 so they release this index every year if you look at the 2019 index okay jharkhand which was one of the worst states in india in terms of mpi okay so the four worst states are bihar jharkhand uttar pradesh and madhya pradesh in these four states jharkhand has made the most amount of progress okay child so infant mortality is i think when you die within one year and child mortality is the if you die within five years okay ashish that's that's the difference here okay um yeah so where was oh, so okay so this is one thing that jharkhand has made the most progress and secondly something that this something very interesting that this report pointed out was that there are only three countries in the world including india where poverty reduction in rural areas is better than poverty reduction in urban areas which means which is an indicator of pro poor development right so in every country basically people are migrating from villages to go to cities to beat poverty right in india it's one of the countries where the uh, so there is obviously poverty reduction in rural areas and urban areas both but poverty reduction in rural areas has outpaced the urban areas which sort of is an indicator that the government is actually working for development of the poor people okay so this is something that you can take away from this um now okay let's do another very short topic i think we have time oh, yeah so i think you if you followed the news our prime minister also keeps on talking about the idea of ease of doing business so ease of doing business is not something that happened in 2020 it's basically a report that is published by the world bank okay now what the ease of doing world ease of doing business report is i hope that you have a rough idea by now so basically there are 10 indicators like enforcement of contracts uh, electricity connection uh, let's say um and i'm i'm kind of forgetting but there are 10 indicators in the ease of business doing report and therefore every country is graded on how good it is performing vis a vis those 10 indicators right so in every country two cities are selected wherein these indicators are studied for studied okay so until 2019 delhi and bombay were the two, mumbai were the two cities in india for which these indicators are properly studied for so under the 2020 is of doing business now this has expanded to your um, uh, kolkata and bangalore as well okay now four cities will be studied here okay so one of the things that so in the one of so another thing in sorry so in those 10 param- parameters where there was this parameter known as registering of property which is a nightmare in india please ask your parents how much of a trouble it is to register property okay now the department for promotion of industry and internal trade wants to improve the process of registering property because india has been really performing badly and our rankings are increasing but they could have become better had we done something about registering of property okay so india so in 2019 we done a great job we had reached the 77th position but in the 2020 ranking we have jumped to 63rd place okay so the two important things that you have to take away from here is that we are now ranked 63 as opposed to rank 67 and the second thing is apart from bombay and delhi bangalore and kolkata have also been added um harsh are you can you listen to me i think there are certain things that i have missed out so there are a couple of topics do we have time to discuss them yes so we have um 
ओके ओके सो लेट्स डिस्कस दिस लास्ट टॉप व्हाट हेलो नो सर नो सर वी हैव टाइम यू कैन टेक यू कैन टेक द टाइम ओके okay cool so this this thing wto peace clause is something that is covered in economics it's also somewhat covered in international relation it's it's a very important topic okay so recently there was a news that india has invoked the peace clause of wto for exceeding the ceiling on support it can offer to farmers for rice okay now it's the first time that any country has ex- has used this peace clause so now let me tell you what the peace clause is okay so under the wto there is an agreement on agriculture which says that for a developing country a developing country can only support its farmers to the extent of 10% of the total value of the produce okay so the support comes in forms of form of msp it comes in form of let's say ammonia sorry urea subsidies etc right so for a developing country like india the permitted percentage is only 10 so this year india informed the wto and said boss sorry we have spent 11.46% of the value of production and therefore we are breaking this de minimis level and therefore we are in violation of the wto however when the agreement on agriculture was being negotiated under article 13 there was a concept of due restraint or peace clause which basically said that there might be certain conditions in developing countries wherein they will have to give more support and they will have to give more msp etc to the farmers and corona virus is in fact definitely that condition you can invoke the peace clause in these circumstances okay so generally countries are not supposed to spend more than 10% on of the total production value in terms of subsidies in terms of let's say msps etc but india this year said that especially for rice we have spent 11.4% however the reason that india is giving so the idea of world trade organization is to make sure that the trade in any commodity is free and fair which means that the states are not supporting their farmers to the extent of detrimental to the extent detrimental to farmers in other countries right so let's say if india is so that's effectively your china is accused of right why is the chinese why are the chinese goods so cheap everywhere because china subsidizes its, its producers and therefore because production cost in china is very low it floods other countries market with cheap chinese products okay so to prevent something like this under under the agreement on agriculture some terms were discussed vis a vis agricultural products okay however the government of india said that okay we have spent money we have so do you guys understand how msp works so minimum support price is basically the price that the government of india says that hum itne mein aap se chawal khareedenge before the harvest season now msp is an open ended procurement scheme okay so the government as long as you can get rice to the government the government will never say no so the government won't say that oh i have i wanted to collect only 100 kgs of rice now you brought me 100 kgs of 105 kgs of rice i will only pay you for 100 kgs no msp is an open ended procurement process as long as you are able to keep ki- get me rice i as government of india i am obligated to keep buying that from you okay big and the reason why government of india does that is basically it wants farmers to keep producing certain things like wheat and rice because we in the past have suffered from famines okay india is a country which has been which has people dying of hunger we've had famines then right after independence we were dependent on donation and food grains from other countries because we just didn't have enough to feed our own people right so india has had a history of famines and therefore india says that i don't want people or rice growers and wheat growers to follow the market and let's say if there is a reduction in the price of wheat and and rice in the normal market then the next year the farmer will not produce that uh, wheat and rice and what if next year there is a general famine then how will i feed the population right to make sure that the government of india has enough buffer stock to feed its population in terms of a famine the government of india comes up with a strategy of msp now msp also ensures that the farmers also get reasonable amount of money they also don't become poor they also have a sustainable life and at the same time government says that we also have enough food to make sure that we can feed people in terms of hunger so obviously during the corona virus crisis when immense lockdowns were used government of india had directed food corporation of india to go for open market sale of its uh grains and therefore a lot of poor people in india were provided free food we could only do this because government of india 
has an open ended msp policy so if you produce rice if you produce wheat and there's an msp on it i as government of india will keep buying and i will store this food maybe because in some sort of an emergency we would need it and corona virus proved that we really need that food and it's the only reason why people haven't died of hunger in the lockdown right because obviously they don't have money but at least because government of india has been procuring so much food people have food to eat okay so government of india told wto that there are two reasons why we have spent this much money first of all we are not buying this to then sell it in the international market for cheap there is no commercial basis we are buying this to meet our food security needs hamare needs hamare paas bhookhe log hai hame unhe khana khilana hai hame farak nahi padta we are not going to sell this price sell this cheap rice and cheap wheat to people in uruguay we will you sell it to we will not even sell we will donate it to people in darbhanga and bihar who are dying of hunger right so therefore india said that we are therefore violating this condition and therefore india is saying that now we are going to invoke the peace clause okay so uh so when the agreement for the peace clause when the agreement for agriculture was being discussed it was decided that the peace clause would remain in effect for a period of 9 years and it will expire in 2003 okay so however g33 countries which were led by india basically developing countries uh said that we will extend this temporary peace clause for four years and this was decided in the bali ministerial conference of the wto okay on grounds of food security then in nairobi when another conference of the wto which is known as the nairobi ministerial conference took place the countries decided that okay there are certain negotiations and discussions that we want to do about agriculture there are certain issues vis a vis agricultural market but we will extend this peace clause indefinitely until and unless we are able to come to a conclusion vis a vis the global agriculture market right so after the nairobi conference this peace clause wherein exemption can be claimed for a certain period of time will continue indefinitely and this is the peace clause that india has used which has been in the news recently so i am i one hope that you are able to understand some of these things i think in the like letter on indian agriculture i had in the not the letter in the video that i think we had done with shweta ma'am i had talked about the problems that india is facing so this was one of the problems vis a vis the subsidies are not in consonance with the wto regime okay um so now another thing that that i want to discuss is pds okay one second so one second yeah so recently what we saw in the news so now i i've explained to you how msp works right and from msp the food is collected and it is stored in godowns and then it is distributed to the poor people via the public distribution system or the pds system so if you you i don't know if you've seen them or not like you guys are fairly privileged but there are fair price shops in every town and every few kilometers in cities where the poor people who hold ration cards get rice for i think 1 rupee per kg and they get wheat for like 2 rupees per kg if you go out and buy you will probably get for like 35 40 but the public distribution system is for people who are poor and who who, who are ration card holders okay now so andhra pradesh was the first state which said that let's go with automation of the public distribution system and recently punjab has been in the news because now it has started an electronic point of sale okay so what electronic point of scale basically is that now i don't have to hold my ration card and go everywhere if i go somewhere to a fair price shop and i am registered with aadhar then i can put my fingerprint there and then i can get my ration okay now this is now this ep epos scheme is working with the larger context so if you've been following this new news government of india has been discussing the idea of one ra- one nation one card okay one ration card so the problem right now is let's say i am a citizen i am a resident of himachal pradesh and i am a poor person okay i have a ration card here a ration card is generally given to the family okay so let's say i have a ration card here but let's say my father has migrated to delhi for work okay now he is he continues to be a pure poor person but he has to leave his ration card with us so that we can get food for let's say three people and he will have to buy expensive food in delhi because he doesn't have the ration card from delhi he only has a ration card from himachal and let's say we buy food for four people but we are three people only and we are not using that food so some of that food gets wasted and then my father is not able to purchase cheap food in delhi so the idea behind one ration one nation one card is that if and especially if you combine it with let's say 
Aadhaar. Now the idea now is that three of us can continue to stay in Himachal, go get our fingerprints done in that in that shop, and then we can take ration for three people. And my dad, who's a poor person in Delhi, can claim his own share of ration from. the fair price shops in delhi okay so this is the broader idea of one nation one ration card that is being talked about and obviously when there is an electronic point of scale and when there is integration with technology it will become much easier for poor people to claim claim the basic right to eat anywhere and everywhere in this country right because who are the people who have these ration cards you have these are your laborers that etc and these laborers keep on migrating they are not like ask ki 25 saal ek hi shehar mein nikal diya they will work here then probably their road has to be built in uttar pradesh then all of them will go to uttar pradesh and maybe next season a road has to be built in gujarat then these people will go to gujarat now obviously the ration card from uttar pradesh or himachal is not going to work in gujarat right so therefore the one nation one ration card is something that is really required and and the government is taking decent steps in that direction okay um let's one second the so contract farming i think we can discuss later so the last thing that i want to discuss today is coal mining because coal mining is something that's also been in the news so recently government of india came up with the mineral laws amendment ordinance 2020 okay so what the government of india da, da, does here is that update under this ordinance there are two important things okay so before what the government of india did let me try to explain to you what was the coal policy in india okay so in india there is a government owned monopoly company called coal india limited okay so only coal india limited was permitted to mine gold and mine coal and sell it in the market now the other concept that existed was this concept of captive mining okay so some companies who are experts in let's say steel or any other industry that requires coal only these particular companies could bid for or sorry only these companies were given your coal mines to let's say mine coal and because of this captive mining model so captive mining basically means that if i am mining coal in that particular mine only i can use that coal in my iron ore industry or some other industry i can't sell that particular coal in the open market okay now obviously there are multiple problems with that there are efficiency losses etc so therefore government of india has come up with the mineral laws ordinance which now says that captive mining is a thing of past any company that is incorporated in india so any indian company can go for mining of coal you do not need to follow this process of captive mining anymore you can mine coal and you can sell it in the open market okay now why this is being done because if you look at it paradoxically india has the fourth largest coal reserves however we imported 235 million tons of coal last year out of which we could have easily provided 135 million tons so it's effectively Like an import bill, an additional import bill of one lakh seventy one thousand crores. Okay, so these are huge. Like this is huge amounts of money, and there is no point in exp in in importing coal from other countries when we have coal in our own country, right? So the thing is, India, in spite of the fact that it's the third largest producer of coal in the world, it is also the third biggest importer of coal. So it's not making a lot of sense. The policy of captive mining was not making a lot of sense because there are certain small industries also that require coal, right? Let's say I want, let's say, let's say I every year I want three thousand kgs of coal. Now I'm not going to set up a mine or I'm not going to go to the government and say that please allow me. to run a mining project of my own so that i can just extract this 3000 uh, kgs of coal every year right obviously if there is an adani or a tata that probably needs like 3 lakh kgs of coal every year they can go for a mining contract and then they can go for captive mining but small industries like me do not have the opportunity to do that and therefore we have to import coal from other countries which is a more expensive then transportation costs are added and then it adds to our import bills because i am going to have to pay those companies in dollars right and i am going to provide jobs to miners in those countries why don't i provide jobs to coal miners in my own country why don't i make those payments in rupees so therefore the government has now come up with this ordinance which has done away with this practice of captive mining so hush this is basically pretty much that i had to discuss today we'll probably do a little bit more tomorrow and then we we'll look at other basic concepts of ecol so if people have a problem with that okay yes sir Thank you so much, sir. And uh, let's continue this tomorrow with uh, the important concept around the field of economics. Mm, I will teach some banking, etc. What repo rate is, etc. All of these things. Yeah, that's quite confusing if somebody is not from economics background.
yeah one uh, uh, to understand these term repo rate reverse repo rate bank yeah. rate thank you so much for being here okay thank you ashish